Shall we start? Okay, great. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Robert Huang here. I, you, he's um, he's a PhD student at Caltech, and already at this stage, he's done a lot of exciting work on um, uh, efficiently learning, uh, uh, you know, quantum systems, making predictions about them. Uh, he has this work on classical shadows, which he's already spoken about here. So it's it's pretty uh, remarkable that already at this stage he's um, he's one of the few people who's speaking more than once at the quantum colloquium. So today he'll tell us about very recent work on um, on learning to predict arbitrary quantum processes. So looking forward to it, Robert. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Robert, and today I'll be talking about learning to predict arbitrary quantum processes. This is a joint work with Sitan Chen and John Presco. So very recently, we have seen a lot of progress in understanding how to efficiently learn and predict quantum states, in particular through the development in shadow tomography, classical shadows, et cetera. And in today's talk, I'll be focusing on understanding if it's possible to develop efficient learning algorithms for predicting quantum circuits, or even more generally, quantum processes. So understanding such a question is important and could potentially lead to many advances in different fields. For example, if we can efficiently predict how chemicals would interact with one another, then it could potentially lead to design of better catalysts or drugs. It could also potentially gain allow us to gain new insights into exotic quantum many-body dynamics or could help us benchmark quantum devices and understand how to improve them. In today's talk, um, the setting that I'm going to work with is the following. So essentially the basic problem is to train in a, mach a machine learning algorithm so that it can learn to predict the following function given by FE. So this function takes in two um, objects. The first is an input quantum state and the second is an observable. And the unknown part of the problem is there exists this unknown quantum process um, represented by a CPTB map E. And the goal of the ML algorithm is to learn about this unknown process E so that given some input state role, it can predict what's the property under this observable O for the, for the output state. So as one could see this, includes any function that's computable by a quantum computer. And furthermore, if we don't place any restriction on the CPTV map E, for example, this could potentially be an exponentially deep quantum circuit, then this might also require an exponential time for a quantum computer to efficiently learn and to efficiently compute such a function. In particular, there are this kind of problem arises in various different settings. Um, the first is say we wanted to predict outcomes of a physical experiment. Say, for example, the initial state um, is given by say some classical description that describe the initial configuration of certain quantum system and say that's represented by rho. And this unknown CPTP map E is essentially the physical process that happened in the experiment. And finally, um, what the scientists measure at the end is this observable. And the goal is to be able to predict what if we configure certain different chemical um, or certain different configurations, what's the corresponding output um, of the physical experiments. And the second example considers a setting that arises in training quantum neural networks. So quantum neural networks are essentially just a parameterized quantum circuit. So you have a unitary that's parameterized, and you can think of that as an unknown CPTB map. And in this case, usually what people consider is there's some classical vector X. What people would do is then one would encode that into a quantum state through some fixed encoding or perhaps some trained encoding. And then there's going to be the quantum neural network that would evolve the state role. And then at the end, we will measure some single fixed observable. So say some fixed local observable like a ZZ correlation in at the output state. And people try to train such a neural network to do different kinds of tasks. That's also encompassed by this setting. And the third example also arises in the literature, but mostly done in a more heuristic fashion, where the goal is to train a machine learning algorithm 
to speed up quantum dynamics. So in this case, the CVTB map E is actually known, and it's a, it's a quantum dynamics, maybe some unitary that we will try to compress and speed up. And the goal is to train an ML model such that hopefully the ML model could find some more efficient way to essentially predict what's what if you feed in this row and what's the corresponding observable O that one measure. So these are just three examples that follows this setting. And this is going to be the main sort of problem we're going to look at. More precisely, the goal is the following. So suppose we're given some uncubed CPTP map E that represents a very highly complex quantum process. So it could potentially have, say, exponential complexity in it. And the goal is to perform some experiments on this complex quantum process to generate some classical data set about the process, process this using classical computer, and after that, create a learned model so that given some new input states, one could utilize this learned model to predict properties of the output state. So that's going to be the main goal of today's talk. And I'm going to separate the talk into the following three parts. The first, I will talk about a classical version of the problem. Then I will look at a restricted version. And finally, the last part, I would generalize it to tackle the original quantum problem that we, that we just described. So as a start, let's look at a classical version of this quantum problem. So this is actually a well-studied problem. And here, instead of having a quantum process, we just have, say, some unknown classical Boolean circuit C that maps n bits to n bits. So now the input is not a quantum state anymore. It's just some um, um, bit string x. And let's say we also, to make the problem easier, we focus on a fixed property. So we just wanted to predict um, a single output bit of the Boolean circuit. So let's say it's the first output bit. So now we can write out the relationship between the input x and the output um, as, the, as this function fc of x. And in a more quantum terminology, that would be you prepare some basis state X, evolve under this Boolean circuit C, which gives rise to another basis state. And now you take the trace with Z1. That will give you a number that's either one or negative one because C of X is a, is a basis state. So this problem has been studied um, substantially in the classical learning theory literature. Um, and it's well known that this is very hard. Um, so first, let's look at the worst case situation. So suppose that we want to learn a model h of x such that um, h of x and fc of x um, differs by less than 0 0.5 for all the input x. And now the main problem here is that this function fc is actually a, an unstructured function. So it, it can take any x into any value, negative plus or negative one. So one way to think about this is this is just an exponentially long vector um, with two to the n different entries, and there's no structure to it. So if you wanted to learn such a function, um, you have to query fc of x for all input x. And as a result, it would re uh, give rise to a query complexity that grows exponentially in system size. But that's only for worst case. But actually, even if you consider the average case, that is you wanted to learn a model h of x such that when you have a randomly sample x from say the uniform distribution over this n bit strings, if you wanted to have this average case prediction error, that's just less than say 0 0.5, which is a pretty big number, um, then one can easily show that we still need to query fc of x for at least half of all the input bit string x. The reason is because if you didn't query some part, uh, some part of the input, um, all you can do, the, actually the best you can do is just predict zero because that gives you a prediction error of one. But then if you only query it for less than half of the input, then your prediction error is going to be greater than 0 0.5. And as a result, you have to query at least half of it. And since there's an exponential number of them, you have to query 0 0.5 times 2 to the n. So that still gives rise to a query complexity that scales exponentially um, in system size. So, so one could really see that if you don't impose anything about the classical circuit, uh, it's a very hard problem. The query complexity grows exponentially in both worst case and average case, and it's well known that this is the case. And now, um, very recently, people have also shown that if we restrict ourselves to, say, um, shallow classical circuit, then the problem is still computationally hard. Um, this is no longer query um, inefficient, but 
assuming that LWE is hard for a quantum computer to solve, then one could prove that um, even achieving a small constant average prediction error is computationally hard even on quantum computers. And this is true even when you restrict the classical Boolean circuit to be constant depths. Um, in particular, the more precise statement is constant depths Boolean circuit with majority gain. That is circuits in this class known as TC0. Um, this is still hard. As one could see from just a review of these well-known results in classical learning theory, this problem is indeed very challenging um, when you just focus on um, the classical analog of it. That is, when you look at this problem where the input is just plus and minus and the circuit is a classical Boolean circuit, this is exponentially hard problem to solve. And now what we would like to look at is sort of a quantum analog of this, which also forms a restricted version of what we're going to talk about um, at the end. So in this case, we replace the classical circuit by a quantum process. It's also an arbitrarily high, high complexity process. And we also only focus on predicting the excitation value for the first qubit, the Z1. But now instead of having input states that are just product, uh, that are just like basis states, like this bit strings, we focus on input states that are tensor product of single qubit pure states. So, so this is just this product state. And now we would like to understand if this problem is actually harder than the original classical problem. Particular, similar to how we can define this function fc, which is also equivalent to having this exponentially long vector, we can also define an associated object, which is this observable O. This observable O is essentially the Heisenberg evolution of this Z1 under this unknown quantum process. So this observable O would also be an unknown object. It's an unknown, highly complex observable. And for the classical problem that we just look at here, um, this observable would be diagonal. And the diagonal of that observable would just be this exponentially long vector um, that we just talked about. But now this can potentially have off diagonal elements. Um, so so it can, it, it's a more expressive model. And now the goal that we want to understand is, is it possible that we can efficiently learn about this observable O such that given some product states, we can predict the expectation value efficiently. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this data set. It's a very simple data set. Essentially, we just prepare some random product state, so like sampling random examples, evolving under this process, and then measure the first qubit, and which is equivalent to preparing random product state and measuring this observable O. So now what you get is you're going to get this classical data set. Say we do this for capital N different times. Now we will have capital N different random product states with their associated value YL. So YL is going to be a random variable that's either plus one or negative one, because when you measure it, it just gives you plus one or negative one. But its expectation value would be equal to the desired quantity. That is the expectation value of O um, in this random product state, Psi L. So now the prediction task is as follows. We're given this classical data set about this unknown, highly complex observable O, and the goal is to learn from this data set so that given a new state, here we're just going to focus on product state, given a new product state, we can predict um, this expectation value accurately. So now it's like kind of a dual of the classical shadow problem where you're in classical shadow, you try to learn about states, but now this is like essentially learning about this observable O, which is unknown. And this observable O is, as I said, it's the Heisenberg evolution of Z1 under the unknown quantum process. And one could also map it back to the classical problem. So in the classical problem, this observable O would be a diagonal um, matrix. And all of these states psi would be restricted to tensor product of zero and one um, uh, and bits instead of more generally this kind of pure state. So now using this relation between, between the, um, but the, using this reduction, one can easily show the worst case hardness for this problem. So say if we want to learn a model at job psi such that um, given any product state psi, you can predict um, the expectation value of O on this product state up to a constant error, say 0.5. Um, one can 
easily show that this problem is at least as hard as this classical problem. So all the hardness translate into this here. So you get like query complexity for this has to scale at least exponentially um, in, in system size. So in the worst case, this, this problem is even harder. However, um, it's not entirely clear what happens when you consider the average case. Um, so in particular, suppose we would like to learn a model such that for a random product state, we can, uh, we can predict the expectation value of O accurately up to some constant. Um, previously, we've seen that for the classical problem, this is still exponentially hard. You still need like two to the n minus one um, query in order, to, in order to solve this problem. But what's interesting here is that for this quantum analog, the, the, this problem is no longer hard. In particular, the training set size can be made very small and the computational time could also be made into quasi polynomial. And that's essentially what we're going to talk about throughout this talk. Like why is this the case and what's the underlying techniques for establishing this result, saying that in order to predict an arbitrarily complex observable, we can do it efficiently. Can I so ask the main... a question or yeah. are we waiting to the end for questions or? Um, Umis, do you have a preference on, can we? Uh, no, no, please, please go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I just want to make sure I understood like sort of like the right analogy between the quantum problem and the classical problem. Because what I had in my mind would be like, okay, um, the quantum state row, the analog should be like a probability distribution. And like the observable, the analog should be like a random variable or a function from the, the domain of the distribution to the reals. And I guess like the quantum process script E would be like a stochastic matrix. So like this was a little bit like the the analog I was expecting, but it didn't seem to quite match onto the slides that you like. Do I have it? So I guess you're saying like um, here maybe we should consider more generally not just classical circuit, but say a stochastic classical circuit. I, I think that 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 could make sense, but I mean that that makes the problem even harder, right? I guess like for example, like what is like uh, the analog of rho here? Like I expected it to be a probability distribution. Oh yeah, but here this is um that's in, in in this specific restriction we're just focusing on pure state. So I guess it's uh oh so like it's a it's a probability distribution with one outcome. I see. Yeah. So so I, I would imagine that the corresponding analog of pure state should be the basis states in classical world. So that's how I make the analogy. Um, I guess so. But I guess suppose if you apply like okay, I guess maybe then in that case like the outcome of the circuit is like the probability distribution. Right, that's true. Okay, well, let me not yeah. uh, take too much time. I think I, I think I understand what's going on. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So, so here we're just focusing on 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 pure state instead of like uh like like mixed state. But I guess if it's mixed state, then definitely that should also be a distribution over input rather than. But yes, but but I agree. Um, there are some relation. Um, I mean, so. you'll get like a mixed state when you put it through script E, right? Um, yeah, yeah, but that's 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 most generally. But you can also have this e to be a, a, a like a, a a unitary, right? So then you still get a pure state. Okay, so so go, going back next. Um, so essentially, the the main difference between the two setting is actually whether there exists low weight approximation. So lower approximation is just the following: say we write out the observable as a, the, in the Pauli basis, which is essentially a form of Fourier transform. And now we just truncate all the highway Pauli. That is this absolute value of P just consider how many non-identity components is in the Pauli. And we only retain ones that have non-identity that's less than or equal to K. So now we have this low weight observable OL, uh, O low. Now, what we have for the quantum setting is the following lemma. Essentially, when you have, on average, some random pure product state, this psi, then the expectation value of O is actually going to be close to the expectation value of O low. And it actually would decay exponentially if you make the low weight, the, the weight higher and higher. So intuitively, one could think about it as following. That's, that means that for most of the product state, psi O psi would be approximately equal to psi O low psi. Essentially, we can use this low weight approximation as a good 
surrogate for the original observable. And this is where the, the two setting actually depart is that this low way approximation doesn't hold in the classical version of the problem. That is when you average over just basis states, you, you don't get this decay um, in one over three to the K. So in the classical setting, the observable is diagonal and all of these expectation values are over basis states. Um, in that kind of situation, um, you, you, even if you take K to be very large, um, there's not necessarily going to be any sort of decay. And that's when the quantum and the classical setting departs. And that's why this quantum problem becomes easier than the classical problem. And one way that I think about this, which I think is going to get closer to what Ryan was asking, was in the classical setting, these classical inputs, they're all perfectly distinguishable. So you can have a measurement that can perfectly distinguish it. So in this case, the, the, the function you're trying to learn can be highly sensitive to what your input is. Basically just changing a, a bit can result in completely different results. And so that's why um, when you learn about some of the classical inputs, you don't learn about anything about uh, for the other part of the classical inputs. On the other hand, when you have this like pure quantum states input, um, they're no longer perfectly distinguishable from one another. They have a lot of overlap. For example, zero state and plus states have a lot of overlap. So when you learn something about zero state, you actually can infer about things on the plus state. And because these random product state has so much overlap with one another locally, um, they actually like learning about some allows you to infer about other. And that's why the learning problem can become much easier. And another way to think about this is because they're not perfectly distinguishable, you cannot create a function so that it varies very dramatically when you move in this quantum, like you move in this quantum product state um, space. So that smoothness and the lack of sensitivity essentially says that when you have a random product state, like for most of the random product, for most of the product state, um, you're not going to see the high frequency component of the original observable. And that's why you can do low way approximation to the original observable and still um, get good prediction. So, so it is uh, this kind of settings about the quantumness of the input state that actually makes this low weight approximation possible. So using this very simple idea, one can then say, oh, now what the ML model should do is it should just learn the low weight approximation. It should learn the low weight observable uh, for some small K. And we know that using the low weight approximation lemma, um, it will give similar prediction as the original observable uh, in the average case. In particular, learning this low weight observable is possible using the following identity on Fourier transformation. So in particular, all of these Pauli coefficient alpha P in this low weight observable can be reconstructed using this, uh, this, this estimation. Essentially, you take the output state, uh, output YL in the classical data set, uh, multiply it by the psi L P plus L for some low weight P and average over it and re properly rescale it. And then you would get the alpha P coefficient. So, so by doing, but, but this is only going to be accurate in expectation value. Um, in, in practice, there's going to be um, statistical fluctuation in, in, in this reconstruction. Um, so we have to control the statistical error in order to understand how many, how much data is actually required in order to learn a good approximation to this low weight observable O though. So one more question to make yes. I'm following along. Sorry, sorry. Would you have a similar effect classically if like instead of like querying just like one full string of pluses and minuses, you queried like half the bits are plus or minus one random and half of them are like stars to get like the average over like filling in of the stars. So what do you mean stars? Like instead of like requesting like what is the function on like this all you know string of bits plus or minus one. Like mm -hmm. it's kind of like the erasure model. Like you put like a question mark in for like one third of the bits and you get back the average over always of filling in those question marks. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. In that case, I, it would become also easy, right? I think. Uh, it become like more analogous maybe. That's, that's true. That's true. Because it, yeah, I think like, for example, if you just consider zero one versus plus minus, like that's your quantum input, then in that case, the plus minus, um, becomes more like the like the star that you're mentioning, right? So in that case, um, if the if the 
function is not, <coughs> yeah, if the function is just diagonal, then that will become the star um, that, that you're mentioning. And I think in that case that you would also get the low weight approximation. So I think that's, that's definitely or, true. Or maybe if you okay, allow thanks. for, sorry, maybe also if you allow for random distributions in the classical case, product distribution, for example. So you, I guess you're saying like, um, <clears throat> you're saying like, say you have this product state and now you just take the diagonal of it, then, then yeah. yeah. So, so well, I'm, I'm just trying to answer. understand your intuition that the, the classical case is sharp where the quantum case is smooth, right? And you yes. cannot, so if you, if in your input in the classical case is just like mm -hmm. a, a product state of a, a distribution of strings, but the dis distribution is simple. It's, it's a product state of, of single bits distribution. Then it also is smooth. It is no longer uh, so sharp and you can, and you cannot distinguish so much between different distributions and That's different true. distribution maybe will give you different in, more information about, I mean, so would it be the same in that case? I mean, would the classical case be easier? I think so. Like if you, if you try to smooth out your input, kind of like putting in stars or making it like, um, like a smooth distribution, that would also enable something like a low weight approximation, I think. Okay. And that would also make the problem easier. Um, right. but one thing that's here, is that, okay, so, so there are two situations. First is you can pick an observable, which is just diagonal. Now the quantum input is essentially going to be smoothing things out um, in, in that space. But one might ask like, maybe what if you pick some other observable um, that are in the quantum space, could you actually still make it sensitive? But essentially, the answer is no. You can you cannot um, make it sensitive because the because the quantum state inputs are just not not orthogonal to one another, and that that causes these kind of overlaps, um, which are similar to like you kind of smooth out the input of the classical things. That would also make the complexity um, much lower. So I think. Right. That's... Thank, thank you. Yeah. So now um, the question becomes: How large should the data size and be? Um, in order for us to learn a good approximation to this low weight observable. And essentially what we will show next is you, if you wanted to learn it up to a constant relative error, then we actually only need uh, a number of training data that's logarithmically in system size. In order to answer this question, we would have to uh, do a very big detour and talk about something completely different. Um, so. So I'm going to talk about a different task on optimizing quantum Hamiltonians and using the guarantee of an optimization algorithm, I'm going to go back and, and resolve the question about how much data is required to learn this low degree approximation. So the task is very simple. We're given some uncubed K local Hamiltonian H, which is a sum of Pauli operator that have at most um, K non-identity. The goal is to find some state that tries to maximize or minimizes the energy. So you might not find the optimum state, but you might find some good enough state that have either higher value of energy or lower value of the energy. In particular, we want to have a guarantee on this psi edge psi based on the description of the Hamiltonian edge. So there are several works um, that focuses on guarantee of this energy based on the optimum value. Um, but there are also several works that focus on the guarantee based on, say, the Pauli coefficient alpha p. So, so, so for this part of the talk, we're going to be more closer to the second one, the latter, which is we wanted to have a guarantee that depends on the structure of the Hamiltonian and what this Pauli coefficient alpha p are. In particular, we have to first define a notion called the expansion property. So given a Hamiltonian h, we say it has an expansion coefficient c e, and an expansion dimension DE, if for every size DE region R, the number of Pauli observable P that have non-zero coefficient, and furthermore, it's either being fully covered by the region R or fully covers the region R, that is these two conditions, um, the number of these Pauli operator is at most CE. So just to give some example, say we focus on a size two region consisting of these two qubits, um, and here are just some examples of Pauli string such that it, it, it would count into, into the, set, the set that follows this. The so first is that the domain of P, which is the qubits that P axon complete matches, so like this ZZ term, 
or it fully covers this. So like Z, X, X, Y, Z term, or it's being fully covered by R. So that's corresponds to say, for example, this X term. So essentially we just try to count how many CE. Um, CE is more of a, sort of a simpler uh, parameter. Like when you change it, it doesn't really affect too much, but the dimension really um, comes into play greatly. So dimension one and dimension two will be very different and would also be very different from dimension three and so on. Particular here are some examples. Suppose that you have a geometrically local Hamiltonian uh, on some finite dimensional grid. In that case, one could show that DE equals to one and CE is just a constant because for every qubit, which is a size one region, uh, the number of Pauli operator that acts on it would just be a constant. So CE is one. And the second example is say, we have a general K local Hamiltonian. So you have all possible K body interaction. In that case, um, one could select DE to be equal to K. So now for every K region, there's only going to be um, at most four to the K different um, poly strings that acts on it because it's a K local Hamiltonian. So CE equals to four to the K. And the final example is when we look at a degree D two body Hamiltonian. So that means in the Hamiltonians, there are only um, two body interactions. And for each qubit, it's only going to be involved in um, interactions with the other um, qubits in the system. So in that case, one could also show that DE would be equal to one and the CE would be equal to 16 D. So that's just an upper bit. I hope this gives a sort of a picture about how this DE scales. Usually for geometrically local things, DE scales as it's just one, but when you have these more and more non-local Hamiltonians, then DE start to grow uh, gradually. And the, the main theorem that we show is the following. So suppose we have a Hamiltonian that has expansion coefficient CE and dimension DE. Then if we define this, uh, this R value, which is between one and two, so say if D equals to one, this R value is just equal to one. But when D, when D becomes larger and larger, this R value would also grow and becomes closer to two. Now, given this three parameters, C, E, D, and R, we, have an, we can write down an efficient algorithm that either finds a maximizing product state with an energy, psi h psi, greater than or equal to the, the energy of the random state, plus this advantage term. So it's going to be better than a random state um, by this amount. And the most important part of it is this R norm on the alpha P coefficient. So we can see that if D equals to one, R equal to one, so you get the one norm. Otherwise you get something like 1.5 norm or 1.6 norm and so on. And we call that um, when the norm becomes like one norm is much larger than two norm. So if you can get a one norm advantage, that will be much better than getting a two norm advantage. And then there's also some dependence on CE that was much milder. It's CE to the one over two DE. And there's also going to be an exponential dependence on the locality of the Hamiltonian. So usually we should consider K to be small, which is indeed the case in our previous um, learning theory um, kind of investigation. So the algorithm either finds such a maximizing product state or it finds a minimizing product state with a very similar guarantee, but just replacing this plus with minus, and then with this greater than or equal to by less than or equal to. So because now we wanted the state to be um, have lower energy um, and as low as possible. So that's the main theorem. And one could also compare it with some of the previous results. And essentially the main improvement, I would say comes from this portion this portion about just dependence on this R norm. Previously, there are results that depends on say um, alpha P to the four divided by the maximum of some of these alpha P and so on. So, so in various situation, this result is going to give a symptotically better result. In particular, we actually need the improved thing in order to establish some of our learning theoretic um, applications. So, now what I would like to briefly do is to just showcase what this algorithm looks like, because I think there are some interesting aspects to it. Um, the first step is pretty standard. Um, we just consider um, breaking up the Hamiltonian into different slices. So you have the one body slice, two body slice, three body, and so on. And we just select the slice with the largest value of these alpha coefficients. So we 
restricted and then focused on a Hamiltonian that only has K body polystring. Now, what we would do is we would create K replicas for the system. So for simplicity, that's say K equal to three. So now we would have this NK qubit system. So K replicas of the N qubit system. And for the first K minus two replicas, we're just going to select random product state. And then we're going to optimize for the final replica. And the way we do the optimization is the following. We take the Hamiltonian and then we lift it to this NK qubit system. And we lift it using what we call polarization. That is, it's just a, a linear operation that's being defined on the Pauli operator. And then we just linearly extend it to the space of Hamiltonians. So to give an example, say we wanted to um, construct the polarization of a Pauli string P equal to ZXYII, then in this case, what we would do is we would consider the average of the following six different NK qubit Pauli string. So the first one is this ZXY, and this one, this one, this one, and this one, and this one. So, so there's only six because we focus on K equal to three, but essentially the number of things we average over would be K factorial. So the purpose of this polarization is that it, it breaks apart the interaction um, kind of structure. In particular, you can see that for the first qubit of, of the final replica, it's only going to be involved in interactions that contains one qubit in replica two and one qubit in replica one. So for example, for in this part, it would only involve um, these two um, interactions. So as one can see, there's not going to be any interaction between different qubits in this final replica, meaning that we can just optimize for each of the qubit in the final replica individually. So we're just going to do an exact optimization to find the best product state that optimizes the energy of this polarization of H. And say we found some things like this, what we're going to then do is we're going to essentially just smash together all of these block vector individually using a random weighted sum to get some direction. And now after doing that, this will form a high dimensional direction that we're going to optimize over. That is, we're going to look into this direction and try to optimize for the trace of H times the, on the product state, try to optimize for the energy. We're just going to do a brute force 1D optimization, consider all possible grids, and then just pick the one with the best value. And with a proper set of um, analysis, we can establish this theorem. And the best part about this is this nice norm regarding the alpha P. So why do we want to create such an improved optimization algorithm? Is that this allows us uh, way to prove a generalized version of a quantum bottomless hill inequality. And this inequality states the following. It says that suppose you're given an arbitrary, uh, given an observable O that can be written as the weighted sum of Pauli strings with weight up to K with an expansion coefficient CE and a dimension DE, then we can prove that the spectral norm of O will upper bound some constant times the R norm of these alpha coefficients. So why do we want such a thing? So essentially in many practical situations, we actually we understand what's the spectral norm of O. Basically that just means when we measure certain things, how big the deviation is going to take. Say in many cases we can normalize this. So now the observable is always takes values between negative one and one. So in that case, the spectral norm of O would just be one. And now what this theorem essentially says is when you have this one on the left-hand side, you can essentially use it to upper bound um, the R norm of the Pauli, the Fourier coefficient, this Pauli coefficient. In particular, R is going to be some value between one and two. And that's going to be a very important part. And the proof of this theorem is very straightforward based on the guarantee for this optimization algorithm, which is take the guarantee and we just note that the spectral norm of O upper bounds the energy uh, when you think of O as the Hamiltonian, the energy of, um, of the state that's being generated by the algorithm. And then we just take um, 
essentially this theorem shown here with some massaging, and now we would get this um, norm inequality. Okay, so this, this is a little bit technical, but let me try to sort of say a few words about why this inequality is useful in different situations. So first, let's focus on this observable O being a sum of geometrically local terms. In that situation, we have already shown that DE equals to one and CE is just a constant. And by plugging everything into this bottom plus heel, generalized bottom plus heel inequality, we can see that the one norm of the alpha P would be upper bounded by the constant times the spectral norm of O. So as we talked about before, if the spectral norm of O is just a constant, say one, then we suddenly get an upper bound saying that the one norm of alpha P would be upper bounded by a constant. And what that actually means is the following. So we call that in literature like compressed sensing when there's some unknown vector. So we call that this O is like the thing that's unknown. When we, whenever we have some unknown object, like an unknown vector that is sparse, then we can learn it very efficiently. Just like a logarithmic in the dimension, we can learn it. And in particular, one could also generalize those results to one norm bound. So if you have a good one norm bound, that also means these alpha p are approximately sparse, and hence you can also learn it very, very efficiently. So that's that's how this is going to come into play later in this talk. And another example, which is now becoming closer and closer to this low weight observable that we talked about. So this observable is just a general sum of k local terms. Then we have dimension de equals to k, and the ce would be four to the k. Now in this situation, we can also plug it back in. And what we get is this inequality, saying that the R norm, where R equals to 2K over K plus one, the R norm of this alpha vector is going to be upper bounded by some value that scales exponentially in K times the spectral norm of one. And again, similar to before, since this 2K over K plus one is something between one and two, it also implies a form of approximate sparsity, meaning that this alpha thinks it's going to have a large a large number of coefficients that are very close to zero and setting them to zero is not going to change it too much. And this inequality is a direct quantum analog of the bottom bloss heel inequality, which is, a, which is a result that holds for, um, yeah, which is a result regarding multilinear uh, polynomials. So now we can, after getting these two inequalities, we can go back to the original talk on learning to predict arbitrary quantum processes. So recall that the quantum problem is we have some random product state and the goal is to be able to predict the expectation value of Z1 for the output state. And the basic idea we have done, have obtained so far is that we wanted to learn the low weight approximation of this highly complex unknown observable O. And the question we are addressing is how large should the data size N be so that we can efficiently learn this low weight observable. And now using this bond and bless Hione inequality, we, because it's approximately sparse, um, we can essentially learn it very efficiently, very similar to literature and compressed sensing. In particular, um, the use of bond and bless Hione inequalities for learning classical function was also exploited in a recent work um, um, that, are, that is published this year. So now the essential algorithm is the following. What we essentially do is we just go through all these different low weight Pauli string. We use the Fourier transformation um, identity to get an estimate for these alpha P coefficient. And then because it's approximately sparse, so if we found that this alpha hat P is small, quite close to zero, then we just set it to zero. And now the learned observable is just a weighted sum, I mean, weighted by this estimated alpha P hat. So now one can, get some rigorous guarantee for, for, for this task. For example, if we consider a small constant epsilon, then given a training set size capital N that scales logarithmically in system size, we can show that the prediction error of predicting the low weight observable using this low weight estimated observable O hat low will be upper bounded by this small constant. Meaning that if you wanted to get a small relative error, a training set size of log n is enough. And now recall that this O low is close to the original observable O. So, but it would incur an additional component, uh, epsilon, 
coming from the low weight approximation. But essentially, using triangle inequality, you can easily get this result saying that for any small constant epsilon and epsilon prime, given a training set size that's very small, the prediction error um, can be upper bounded by epsilon plus epsilon prime times the spectral norm of O low. So now if we also look at the scaling with respect to epsilon and epsilon prime, essentially one could show that the training set side has to grow quasi polynomially in one over epsilon and one over epsilon prime. But the full scaling is essentially log n times this quasi polynomial factor. And now we can get the prediction error to, to arbitrary small things um, that scales with epsilon and epsilon prime. So, so as we have seen, the original problem, the classical problem where the input string can really be just complete bit string rather than like distribution or some with star in it, that, that problem is exponentially hard. On the other hand, when we focus on the quantum problem where it's just a product state, because these product states, they, they, they're they not, while they're pure, they're not like mixture of distribution, they're, they're still incompatible to one another. So in this case, low degree approximation works. And when low degree approximation works, one can combine with these techniques to show that one can learn it very efficiently. And also the, the computational time would scale quasi polynomially in the system size n. But that only resolves a restricted version of this problem where we focus on having product state and we focus on only predicting um, a single poly um, observable Z1 on the output string. Now we would like to generalize it to uh, the original problem. So recall that the original goal was to actually learn this quantum process so that for general input state, we can predict various properties of the output state, not just Z1 and not just for product state. So in order to do that, we have to modify the data set we use to probe this quantum process. So previously, we just prepare random product state and measure the first qubit in the Z basis. Now what we do is to make a very minor change. Um, we still prepare random product state evolve it, and at the end, we measure in the random basis, and we measure all the qubits simultaneously. So one way to think about this is this is a, essentially a classical shadow version for quantum process, and there are previous work that explores sort of this procedure and see what you can actually, uh, what aspects about the quantum process you can learn from it. Essentially, in previous work, people showed that you can learn the reduced channel of this quantum process. But here, we are hopefully trying, what we are hoping to do is trying to generalize the fact that you can learn the reduced channel to be able to predict like arbitrary input state, I mean, gener like, uh, general input states and measure um, general more general observables. So now what the classical data set that we obtain is given as follows. We have some random product state given as input, these psi L. And then when we do a random measurement at the end, we would also get some random product state. So these phi L are essentially encoding what is the basis you measure in and what's the outcome you get. So now you create this data set. If you do n rounds of them, you have psi L mapping to phi L um, for some random product state and the, and the random product measurement outcome. So now we would like to see how to make prediction. We are given this classical data set and we are given some state role and we wanted to predict some observable B. So let's say this B also has a spectral norm between negative one and one. I mean, has a spectral norm bounded by one. Um, so all its values between negative one and one. So first, what we are going to do is we're going to take this observable and use it to transform the original data set. So previously, what we have is product state mapping to product state. Now we're going to take this observable and transform the output product state into just some real value using the classical shadow formalism. So essentially using this form, we can create this YL, which is equal to what we want in expectation. That is by doing this post-processing, we can turn the output state uh, output to become this real value. So it's no longer a product state. And this real value has an expectation value that's equal to this. Meaning that in this new classical data set, what we have essentially done is we have feed in this random product state into the unknown quantum process and measure the observable B. Just using classical shadow, we can do this. Um, and furthermore, um, we know that the, the, the variance of this YL, um, it's, it, it might be quite large, but it's always bounded by the shadow norm of this observable B. 
So now the key thing is to understand what this shadow norm actually, actually is. And essentially using this generalized quantum bond and Blasky inequality, again, we can show that for any B that's a sum of local observable, first we can show that the B observable, the shadow norm of the B observable can be upper bound by a constant times the one norm of this beta coefficient. So these poly coefficient. And then using the, the generalized BH inequality, we can show that the one norm of beta is upper bounded by the spectral norm of B, which then means the variance is just a constant. So now we're essentially back to the previous problem where we have this classical data set telling us that for this random product state, there's this corresponding YL value where the YL is in expectation is equal to what we want. And this observable O is the Heisenberg evolution of this observable B. But there's a, there's a main difference. That is in the previous case, we only care about predicting new input that are also product state. But what we want to do here is we wanted to predict new inputs that are potentially say some entangled input state row. In order to do this, we have to extend the low weight approximation result. So previously we showed that when we average over random product state, then we would get the, a decay that's one over three to the K. And now what this lemma essentially says is consider any distribution D such that this distribution D is quite, quite it covers quite a bit of quantum state in particular, it, it covers uh, more precisely, um, the probability of sampling a state role would be equal to the probability of sampling another state, which is the same state followed by some single qubit rotation. Um, Can I ask a quick and, question here? Yeah. Are you still like really have in mind like row is pure? Um, yeah, actually I still have, but, but so if, like for example, if it's ground state, then that's pure, but you can also focus on like thermal states, um, then that will be mixed. Uh -huh. But yeah, but I'm still thinking of it as, as it's pure. Um, I mean, it can potentially be just a distribution over entangled. So, I'm just trying to figure out what is the, like, I made the classical analog of this locally flat, like rho is just like literally one binary string. And then D is like a distribution over binary strings with which property? Oh, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a immediate classical analog. Like I think in the classical setting, um, if it's just binary strings, then this D is just uniform. So it's like the uniform now, distribution. Yeah, but now there could be like the state. Okay, that's what I, okay, that's yeah. what I thought. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but the, the state, but in this case, the the state could have like entanglement inside of it, and then you just kind of sprinkle some kind of local basis uh, invariance, like yeah. like for example, if it's just a ground state of a generic geometric good local Hamiltonian, um, then the associated distribution D would have would would have this property that it's flat under single qubit rotation. Um, or it's a thermal state that would also hold. So these are just some examples of these distribution. And under this, for, for any of these distribution, um, we would get a decay um, for, for, for this lower approximation and exponential decay. But the difference between, the, between this and the previous result is that previous result, we have one over three to the K, but in this result, we have one, one over 1 1.5 to the K. And we're not entirely sure if we can recover one over three to the K, it seems like product state are still indeed easier than entangled state, but we, 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 we still get this exponential decay. So using this, we can do the same thing as before. So, so now the, the, the full ML algorithm is the following. Um, we would like to predict given role, try to predict the observable B. The classical data set is this product state mapping to product state. What we would do is we would use this B to turn the classical data set for essentially the Heisenberg evolution of B under this unknown process E. And then we would run this algorithm to learn a low weight approximation to the origin observable, basically using the Fourier transformation. And then if it's a small, we just set it to zero to learn it. And now after learning this low weight approximation, what we are going to do is we're just going to predict trace of O hat low acting on the input state row. And we can show that this is approximately equal to um, feeding in feeding row into this unknown process, followed by measuring this observable b. So, so yeah, so now to 
um, conclude that there are some quite surprising elements of this ML algorithm. First, um, it doesn't matter what the circuit is. So it could be an exponential size circuit. And even just if you, if you try to predict it up to some constant relative error, we only need log n samples. So there's like kind of, kind of like two orders of uh, complexity involved. So log n samples, um, but we can learn exponential size quantum circuit. Another interesting aspect to it is that it's computationally efficient. Um, it's polynomial time for a constant relative error and quasi polynomial time if you wanted to achieve a small error. And furthermore, just learning from product state inputs, the algorithm can predict highly entangled state input. And finally, the entire algorithm can be run uh, essentially on a classical computer. Um, there's one part that actually requires quantum, which is after creating this O hat low, we actually need to measure on, on the state row. Um, so that's the only quantum part, but all the rest only requires classical processing. So to conclude in this talk, we give a computationally efficient algorithm for learning to predict the output of a quantum process that can potentially have arbitrary high complexity. In particular, this result shows the potential for training ML models to learn these kind of approximate um, description so that one can predict outcomes of a complex dynamics much faster than the process itself. And that's it for my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot, Robert. That's very impressive. Um, is, uh, shall we take time for a few quick questions from the audience before we go to the can panel? There's a couple in the um, Q and A. Right. Um, okay. So I think the first question may have been may have been maybe similar to what you asked, Ryan. So Maris asked, perhaps in the classical case, you could consider a stochastic matrix and look at the average case over product input distributions, where each bit is independent has and has some random bias. So is that uh, uh, Robert, is that is oh, that, I see. Yeah, I think it's still slightly different from what Ryan. But I think there are a lot of different analog one can make. So of course, this is not like that's. What I try to say it's like a classical version. It's not like the classical version. I think one can definitely consider different settings and 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 look at you know, sort of the complexity of it. But I guess um, Mario uh, Maris Ozo was asking, say, if it's a stochastic matrix. I think that part is not going to affect too much because the extreme of a stochastic metric is still just a deterministic metrics. And that's kind of similar to in what, I, what we study here, this quantum process can in, in general be just a, a, a unitary or even just a classical circuit, or it could also be a stochastic matrix. I think the main part is about how we average over the inputs. Um, so here um, we're averaging over say pure state, but in the classical setting, one, one, one correspondence would say I average over um, also just bitstream, kind of like what I talked about. But here, I think Maris Ozo was talking about a different situation where we say it's average over some product input distributions where, um, so it's not entirely, okay, so there are two, two settings. So first is, is, is the prediction you're trying to make already average over? That is, do you first do the average and then compare the output or you, first compare the output and then average. That actually gives very different things. Um, so if you already average out the, the like for example here, um, say in this case, if we put the average of this row inside this absolute value, then 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 you can just set the O low to just be like, like um, essentially alpha P, alpha I, I. So you can do an even stronger kind of approximation because in that case, you're just looking at both the average value. But here we are looking at first doing the differencing and then average over it. And it sounded like, um, so what Ryan was suggesting was something like um, you have some portion of the averaging inside the absolute value. It's like some of the bits are actually um, random and then you already average over it, but there are still some that's outside um, of it. And but it sounded like um, maybe Mary's question was saying, you 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 still consider the average case. So it's it's over, the input state x is the expectation value is still outside of the absolute value, but then in this case the the bits is independent but has maybe some random bias. 
I think there are some results about that known in the classical literature where your distribution is smoothed. So you're not just looking at the uniform distribution, but you're looking at the random bias distribution and considering the average case prediction for that case. And I think there's also some kind of simplification one can make, but I'm not sure if it's as strong as this kind of exponential decay. Um, so that, that will be my, my answer. <laughs> Great. Uh, there, there's another question by Ari Mitzel. Uh, it says, in the case that the observable O is just a high weight tensor product of Pauli operators, yes. why does the low weight approximation work? Yeah, that's also a great question. So I think this, this slide is really the place we should look at. So say this observable O uh, only contains a single bit string, and that's a high weight tensor product of Pauli operators, um, like sigma x on every qubit. That, that's actually going to be um, a very, well, what happens there? If you do this low weight truncation, you're just going to throw away. So now this O low is just zero. So it feels like why, why if we just put in zero, why is it going to work? Um, but the thing that happens here is the following. So suppose you have say some random product state, then in order to really activate that observable, it's going to be very hard because you have to match up the basis for all the local product. Like for example, if it's sigma x on every qubit, then you have to always pick it so that it's close to like on the x axis, then you will activate that observable. Otherwise, if you are if you have some fluctuation, um, if you actually select say zero or one, or you select y plus or y minus, then you're just going to get zero there. And, and, and that's one way to think about it. So, so, so it's very hard to activate those kind of high weight string. And that's why this low weight approximation actually works. Um, great. Um, there's a there's a question from Bill Huggins. It seems like the requirement that the input state be invariant under local Clifford rotations is a is a strong one. Do you have some examples of physically interesting states with this property, or am I misunderstanding the assumption on the input? Yeah. State? So so I think an example is what I wrote down here. Um, not sure if this is if it's physically interesting, but what I have in mind was say you have some um, generic ran like random, like some Hamiltonian that's geometrically local, maybe in 1D, but its basis is arbitrary. And now um, essentially you consider the input state to be say the ground state or some low temperature thermal state of such a Hamiltonian, and then you do a quench. So you kind of like you, you evolve it under some arbitrary quantum process and you wanted to predict what happens at the end. Um, so, so that's an example that I have in mind. Um, I, I'm not, sh I personally think it's kind of, I think it's physically interesting, um, but, but I'm not sure um, whether that, yeah, what, what are, what, like, whether you actually misunderstood what I said or, or this actually makes sense. Um, so it's not the state itself is invariant under local Clifford. Um, like for example, if you just have a product state, um, they're not invariant under local rotation. When you, when you apply a local rotation, it's going to become a different state. That's actually not what we meant. Uh, what we meant is more like just, you consider an average case over a sufficiently broad um, class of states. So, so yeah, so, and actually we think at least one open question in our, in our paper, one of the biggest one is we think this result actually holds more generally for, for much broader classes of distribution over quantum states. And we don't yet know if, for example, to what extent this requirement is actually needed. It feels like as long as you have some distribution that are smooth in the quantum space space, so that there are nearby things that are always with similar probability, then I think this result would hold. Because when you have nearby things that are with similar probability, you have this non-orthogonality. Like the classical thing that, the, the classical distribution is really when it's, it's really like it's, like it's pointing towards a very different direction and they're all very far apart from one another. But I feel like when you have a distribution that's very smooth, then it seems likely that this low degree, low weight approximation was also works. Great. Okay. okay. It's, it looks like um, Ronald DeVolt has some, something in the, in, the, in the chat. Maybe Ronald, since you can, do you want to just speak up and say what you're going to say? Yeah. So there was this nice paper in the last stock uh, conference by, um, Eskenazis and Ivanishvili, and what they did is they gave a classical, very efficient learning algorithm for um, 
uh, learning low degree bounded functions on the Boolean cube. Yes, that's this paper. It's also using a version of Bonham Bluest Hill. So I'm wondering, uh, like, are you sort of giving a quantum generalization of this result? Yeah, I think one way you can you can think about that. But also, like in their paper, they have to explicitly say this function is a low degree classical function. But here, like I said, it, it actually um, works for like any 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 quantum process. So you yeah, don't have. But to I guess the first step of your argument is to go to low degree, right? And yes. afterwards, maybe this argument can take over. Yes. So that's 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 a uh, yeah. There's a lot of parallel. For example, here we're trying to prove a quantum analog of this BH inequality. Which gives rise to slightly different forms, um, and then and then yes, and then we combine. Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of parallels. So you can think of it as like a quantum generation um, on this part, especially. Great. Thank you. Great. So it's, it looks like Ryan has a question, but uh, since you're on the panel as well, maybe we can we can just move on to the panel and then we can talk about it there. Is is that okay, Ryan? Sure. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks, Robert. So maybe if you stop sharing your slides, we can can have the panelists uh, video pinned. So uh, uh, so let's see. Let me let me introduce the panelists. Uh, there's Ryan O'Donnell from CMU, um, who um, I'm sure many of you already know. He's a he does he's worked extensively in complexity theory in in the complexity of Boolean functions. And over the last so many years, he's actually started working also on quantum computing, on quantum tomography, uh, quantum codes, uh, you know, quantum complexity theory. So uh, welcome, uh, Ryan. Um, we also have um, uh, Nathan B from uh, University of Toronto. Uh, so Nathan, of course, you he's been on uh, on this colloquium before uh, several times. Uh, He's uh, he's he's done uh, you know just a lot of work on quantum simulation, uh, you know, quantum chemistry, as well as quantum methods for machine learning. So it's very appropriate to have you on the panel. And uh, finally, we have Tom Gur from um, Uni University of Warwick. Um, uh, uh, Tom uh, works on complexity theory, uh, quantum computing, as well as computational learning theory and uh, sublinear algorithms. So again, you know, very, a very nice uh, set of skills for this particular talk. So um, maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll start with Ryan. Uh, you had something to say and, you know, could you give your comments as well as your question about the, the talk? Uh, sure, thanks. And thanks, uh, uh, Robert, for uh, lots of so much cool stuff in that talk. Um, yeah, maybe before I get to comments, I just want to like, maybe I'll ask my technical questions just so I just make sure I understand everything. Um, I got a little bit confused because like, what is there's what is the assumption is there on the um, the, the quantum uh, channel E? Oh, there's no assumption, right? So, so then, like, can't like this quantum channel E just like throw row in the trash and put out its favorite state row? Yeah, that it could also do that. So then, it's like if in that case, it would be like classical shadow and like shadow tomography, right? I see. Uh huh. Okay. Thanks. Um. Yeah, I guess like uh, you know, uh, well, in in um. Uh, just to explain where I'm coming from, like whenever I like, you know, I have like a quantum learning problem, I'm always trying to like just figure out like what, uh, you know, classical problem it's generalizing. And I usually have in the model, like in mind, like, okay, when I see rho, like I'll translate that into probability distribution. And, you know, if it's on qubits, I'll translate a probability distribution on the, the Boolean strings. And if I see like, uh, you know, the, uh, the observable, I'll translate that into like a function mapping this, the Boolean strings into, let's say the interval minus one, one. And, uh, you know, more rarely, I guess, if there's like a channel, then like you should map it to like, a, I guess, like a, a stochastic matrix that transforms distributions into distributions. So I guess one thing I didn't actually uh, maybe appreciate until I saw your talk and I was just looking at the paper is that like you're really focusing on, um, in some sense, pure, well, kind of like focusing on pure states in the sense that like, which kind of confused me because then the, like the classical analog is like, you're learning from a probability distribution, but like you have a promise that like it puts 100% of its mass on just like one outcome. So uh, I guess I kind of had to like, um, yeah, a little bit undo that, uh, that mindset. 
So I don't know how my I don't know how these panels work. Actually, I'm afraid I'm supposed to be in the first one. Shall I like keep talking or like let him pet another panel? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, it's good to see you internalize the the the, the talk. It's uh, it's, it's yeah. good. Uh, um, um. Yeah, I was just gonna say, like, I mean, one uh, you know, uh, one tension I always feel like with like um learning theory. So like, I used to work on like, you know, just like classical pack learning theory, like way back the day is that like, from a theory point of view, like everything is impossible, right? Like Valiant invents like this theory of pack learning and you're like, oh, this is going to be great. We're going to learn so much stuff. And then like, there's like zero positive results. Like maybe you can learn juntas. Okay. And like, even if you're like, oh, I'm going to severely handicap the model by like insisting the distribution is like the uniform distribution, which practitioners are like, no, that's terrible. Why would you do that? But like, even still, I say like, well, I can maybe sort of learn decision trees if they're sufficiently shallow. And it's weird though, because like every, every time you sort of set up the same set up a framework, like everything is hard, everything is impossible. And so it's depressing. But um, on the other hand, like now, like people are doing all sorts of cool uh, learning results. So like, it seems like it's extremely hard to get like any kind of theoretical model that like matches the real world. And then when you go to the quantum versions, I mean, by definition, they're like generalizations of the classical learning problem. So by definition, they're like, they can only be harder. So you're like, man, if it was like completely impossible before, it's like even impossibler now. Um, so yeah, I'm just trying to like think about like this weird, weird, uh, you know, dis disconnect between like maybe practice, like theory and, and, and practice, you know, you can ring out like every possible way in which you're like, well, if I take low weight linear combinations of juntas like maybe this is also learnable and you're like oh, i'm really struggling and then you know somehow in practice it's not as connected mm. to the theory so okay these are some thoughts that like occurred to me while i was thinking about all this quantum learning stuff so I'll sorry, stop sorry, uh, sorry Ryan, but um but you know when you when you say it's a generalization that's that's in the worst case right but once you start talking about probability distributions then it's a whole new ball game so so when you when you have a when you have a uniform distribution on on classical inputs, that's very different from 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 this, right? I I disagree. I think uh -huh. um, maybe you can state a classical analog that's harder, but then I would say you stated the wrong classical analog. I mean, I just always I mean, I think the correct analog is always you know turn like a state into a probability distribution, turn an observable into a random variable. Turn a channel into a stochastic transformation. That's basically your classical analog. Or it's kind of like, you know, you know, whenever you have like Pauli's I, X, Y, and Z, just delete Y and Z, or just delete X and Y. And now you have like the classical version. And by definition, it can only be easier. Mm, well, I agree with you, you know, almost all the way, except when you get to a probability distribution. So, so yes, it's true that that. You know, you 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 might say, well, uh, I mean, in some in some cases, you might say, well, the analog of a pure state is a probability distribution. But no, no, the analog of a pure analog. state is like a probability distribution with a hundred percent of its mass on one. No, point. so so then it's a classical string, right? Uh, yeah, right. And so, yeah. okay, at least so, this is okay. Go ahead. No, so so <laughs> so isn't isn't the isn't the difference that when you when you when you have a uniform distribution over classical strings. That's different from a uniform distribution over, you know, when if you if you were taking uniform distributions over qubits, that's a different. That that's uh, the thickness that Robert was talking about. I think. Well, it's a subtle thing. Like the the best analog of uniform distribution over classical strings is like the maximally mixed state. Mm -hmm. Like there's a thing. Like there's a difference. Like I I'm still a little bit confused about it. Like in the classical world, you can consider thing two things. You consider the uniform distribution on all probability distributions, which are point masses, or you can consider one probability distribution, the uniform distribution. Mm -hmm. And these are definitely different things, which, you know, shouldn't be confused. Like generally, like for like pack learning, if I tell you you're learning under the uniform distribution on strings, that's pretty hard. Like, you know, you can do some stuff, but it's pretty hard. Yeah. On the other hand, if I tell you, okay, I'm going to pick a random point mass distribution, and then you have to learn under that, your life is great. You're like, I need one sample. I'm pretty much done. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the distinction I see. That's that's right. And and I, yeah. I think it's precisely that in the in the first case that you mentioned, 
the quantum classical difference is larger. Mm. Oh, so like uh, you're saying like in the quantum case, like when it's like you have like the uniform distribution over a pure state, this is quite a lot harder than the uniform distribution over a point mass. Or different, it's, uh, yes. Um, it should only be harder, right? Like in the first no, no, in the classical I, I, case, I, 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 you know I, I, there's I, I, like I, I, literally two to the n possibilities. In the quantum case, you know there's like a continuum of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe, yeah, but maybe, I thought I thought the result was at least the, 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 it seems like it's easier, right? So yeah, and in fact, in fact, it's it's, it's <laughs> well, you know okay. So you're into, I mean, the intuitively you should say well, it would be easier because because now now your typical state is um, you know there, there's there's a lot more overlap. You you have you have a chance that that your output has you know is um, is um, is much more, you know, there are fewer possibilities, you know, it, it, that's the low degree polynomial, right? It's uh, it's much more random, your output, just because, uh, you know, uh, it's not just that you pick, pick that random uh, an input, which was a classical input, and these are all very different. Now you pick that random uh, quantum state, and these these have much more overlap. Uh, I well, no. I still don't buy it. I mean, I'm I'm willing to like keep going and pressing on you if you like, but I don't want to totally derail okay, this. No, I, 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 I still don't we, buy we, it, to be we honest. Should, we should move on. We could come okay. back. So, yeah, but, uh, Nathan, you had something to say. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, from my point of view, I figuring out the classical analog of a quantum learning problem, I, I don't think is unique. Uh, because there's multiple ways that we, you can think about a representation of quantum and classical data. Like, you know, for example, a feature vector that you're considering for a particular learning problem could be embedded in a quantum computer literally as a bit string, or it could be embedded as a uh, pure state wave function. And, you know, there's different, there's different uh, benefits and different issues behind all of those uh, sort of uh, embeddings of the quantum information and or classical analogs of the quantum problem. Um, and so I, or I should say, I guess, quantum analogs of the classical problem in this case. And so because this mapping isn't necessarily like prescriptive, I don't know, I take a, I take a less uh, 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 clear, I've got a less clear view than Ryan does uh, about this, about how we should always think about a classical analog of a quantum problem or vice versa. I think that, you know, you just, we just have to be careful that when we do do the comparison that we're thinking about an appropriate analogy uh, between it and we're clear about it. And sometimes this kind of um, makes me think about something that was mentioned earlier in the talk. Um, which is that there are many ways in which this will have classical analogs. And, and in some sense, the, the main reason, uh, the main power um, of the result comes from this smoothness um, of the inputs versus the, the sharp uh, phenomena in the classical case. And I wonder whether the, you know, this, this dramatic gap of exponential versus something which is um, you know, um, polynomial or, or um, quasi-polynomial, um, whether there is a natural classic, uh, classical analog of the question for which this is also um, possible and efficiently doable. I think this would be also quite interesting. Yeah. So, so, so I guess, uh, was, wasn't there a question uh, if you, if you, uh, you know, so, so as Ryan was saying that these two different notions that, you know, you could say, well, you have the uniform distribution as input, or your, you know, your your you have a uniform distribution over over classical inputs, right? So you're thinking of drawing an input at random. So now, if instead you drew an input at random, but but now not from not from one of the n bit strings, but you drew a input distribution at random, which was a which was sort of a product distribution. Mm -hmm. And now you you ask the same question classically. Wouldn't wouldn't you get low complexity again? Yeah. So I think one way to at least go back to the random product state result, we can say suppose we have this random product state that was being sampled, and now we just smash it onto the the z axis. So now we have this black sphere. We just smash it onto the z axis. 
now that would just be like um probability distribution in in there and and in that case i mean the, everything that i said about the quantum settings like this low degree approximation and so on would also go through into this mm -hmm. model so i think that is a, that that's a place where you can make it into the the setting where it, it makes kind of um like the, the analogy becomes much more similar and, and actually the classical one is just a special case of of the quantum result that I just talked about. So I think that's indeed true. But but then in that case, you're generating a distribution over classical bit strings. But in the original quantum case, it's still a pure state. So I guess now you, you're 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 breaking essentially whether you think a pure state should be mapped into like a distribution with a single point mass on a classical bit string, for example. So so if, if you try to do that analogy, then it would break this other analogy. But I think uh, if you do this analogy, then things becomes closer. But if you do the analogy of pure state is more like bit strings, then 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 the the thing becomes weird. So at least that's my understanding of the of the situation. So Robert, here's a little bit of an uh, annoying question. I'm sure you've gotten you've gotten uh, you've had been forced to answer on a number of occasions. But I, I'm kind of curious about the Choi Jamalkowski isomorphism. Mm. when it comes to this. So, you know, uh, under what circumstances could you view the channel learning problem as a particular instance of the state learning problem? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Like, um, actually, that's also a, 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 a relation that people use in some of the prior work on classical shuttle of quantum channels. So in, in those works, what they essentially do is say, suppose you have unknown channel, take the choice state, which is like feeding in bell pair and then get the state and now do classical shadow on this choice yeah. state. And now you can, of course you can get, you can just port all the results here. Um, but, but then a lot of the things you actually wanted actually doesn't hold anymore. Like for example, if you wanted to be able to like feed in row into this channel and then predict an observable, when you use the cho Jamilkowski representation, what you get is actually it would be some observable um, apply onto the choice state, but like th there's equality you can write down. But actually, that observable will have an inf uh, not, not an exponential um, spectral norm, because mm. in choice state you divide everything by an exponential uh, like two to the n. So now you have to circum like you have to kind of mitigate that. So now the observable becomes like this crazy observable, and classical shadow cannot predict those kind of things. So. Mm. So that, yeah, that causes the connection to break down. And so I guess another thing that I've always wondered about with uh, with this stuff, and I was wondering if you've got any any feedback on, on this, is that I've always kind of wondered about, you know, um, memory in uh, the, the channels. In particular, you know, let's look at so something that would be really simple, like a time-dependent Hamiltonian. Do you have any idea about how you would end up, you know, say learning a parameterized family of uh, say time dependent quantum channels using these types of techniques? Oh, yeah, that's like, so I guess what you mean is you have some channel with additional parameter time and now yeah, you want exactly. to be able to learn all of them. Um, right. So, so in this setting, um, at least in the setting that I just talked about, what one would have to do is the following. So one way to do it is like you pick some random time and for each time you do what I just talked about. So now you kind of get an approximate model of this E. And now what you have to do is you have to perform interpolation or perhaps some kind of extrapolation between different time, right? In order to cover how it's transitioning and so on. So perhaps maybe if it's smoothly, uh, smoothly deviating or has some kind of pattern inside it, then you can also learn, um, learn that time dependent kind of channels for it. So would, would that, is that what you have in mind or you're thinking more yeah, about? I was, no, I, I, was, I was just kind of curious about, you know, um, yeah, I was kind of curious about that. And also, you know, uh, one of the challenges that of course ends up coming up with some other techniques is that, you know, for the time dependent case, likelihood evaluation for short time evolutions becomes uh, 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 no longer possible to evaluate the probabilities that you'd end up seeing because you need you know by necessity to go to a long time evolution so many of the ideas behind classical shadows and things like that end up starting to break down as you start needing to do longer and longer evolutions to end up seeing the long time behavior of your, of your channel 
So, you know, uh, that was one of the, th the things that I've run into when I've tried to, when I thought about trying to do this in the past. So I was just kind of curious about your notions of how it might be done. Oh, I see, I see, I see. But I suppose inside your your formalism, it might not be so bad as the way that I, I'd originally thought about it. Right. I think it, it, because like it depends on how how big it's fluctuating. Like maybe it's like some periodic thing. Then you just learn the time dynamics for for those portion. Maybe using this procedure that I just talked about. So you mm -hmm. have to chunk up for a different time, learn it, and now you can kind of like understand what it looks like. And now you you just keep applying the same thing um, for if it's periodic. But if it's actually changing all the way, then then one would just have to go to higher and higher time in order to learn what that actually is. At least that's I, I think that's that should be the situation. So I guess another thing I'm kind of curious about is uh, quantum. Um, you could I guess you could use your result in order to do something analogous to gate set tomography, couldn't you? That's true. I think uh, that should be possible. Right. And so then if you end up getting the, uh, getting something like that, is there some notion of gauge then that would end up coming in in this uh, in this concept in this? Context? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so in this setting, we're assuming you can control what you feed in and what you measure. So in that case, the, you, 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 you fix all the gauge. So there's no gauge freedom. You can actually learn what the system is if you go to like very large number of measurements and experiments. Um, but then you can also say, maybe we don't know what the state is. Maybe we don't know what the measurements we're doing. We don't know what this E is. And when we were trying to learn everything, yeah. in that case, I think gauge, gauge problem could potentially come in. But mm -hmm. I think sometimes you can avoid it. Like, for example, if the evolution itself is like unitary, then there's ways you can fix the gauge and, and so on. So. I'm a bit curious about um, something else. Um, so you're making no assumptions whatsoever on the um, quantum process, right? It, it could be anything, right? So suppose you do make some assumptions. Suppose you're saying maybe that's, um, I don't know, um, highly structured, maybe it's polynomial time um, generated. Can, can you get something better this way? Yeah, that's a, I think it's also a very, very good question. Um, I, I also thought about it. So like one, one thing that I that I thought about was um, suppose this is more like just time independent Hamiltonian. So so suppose this is just um, say e to the iht where each h is like an interacting Hamiltonian, maybe a local Hamiltonian on n qubits. Then can we do better um, than what we just talked about? And the answer is yes. So in that case, you can learn the channel like up to diamond distance, for example. So like um, when, when you say it's generated by a uh, local Hamiltonian and you can probe different time, then, then there are procedures that you can learn it very efficiently. Um, for example, in this paper in this work, the scaling with respect to the error is quite bad. It's like quasi-polynomial in one over epsilon. But for learning many-body Hamiltonian from dynamics, you can prove that you can learn it with just one over epsilon, essentially. So, so it's like a Heisenberg type limit, so which is like, yeah. And yeah. but 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 if you just assume it's a polynomial time quantum circuit, actually I don't know. I, I don't I suspect so here's my suspicion. Like if it's possible to create something like a pseudo-random unitary, then in that case you can hide information about quasi like this kind of polynomial time quantum circuit and make it kind of computationally indistinguishable from 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 exponential complexity type of quantum circuit, then in that case. I think the hardness would kind of be, be the same. Like uh, you will not get too much improvement. Um, but I think people haven't constructed yet yet. So the, this kind of intuition that I had is not rigorous um, in any way. You know, there's there's something um, not not quite along these lines, but it's it's reminiscent. You know, so um, uh, you know. Uh, this this is in the in the context of random circuit sampling. You know, there's this work of Gao and Duan, um, where where they showed again. You know, in the same you using this uh, this uh, you know this Pauli decomposition that um, that you can you can you can sample only the low weight Pauli 
parallels and, and get a quasi polynomial enter the log n classical algorithm for, for reconstructing the output distribution. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's not it's not the it's not the same kind of learning problem where you're you know now the now the random thing is the circuit, the input is sort of fixed and the output is in the standard basis. But but um, but there seems to be some maybe it's a duality or there's some some way of it, this these may be related. Yeah, I've actually read that paper. Um... So, so yes, indeed, like the low degree approximation part is very similar, but I, if I remember correctly, I think in their paper, the low degree part actually comes from the noise in the system, right? Like for example, like when you apply gates, there's actually um, a noise that causes low degree to happen. And actually I think it, there's a relation. Okay, so using that intuition, one could also get a result here is suppose you have some distribution, um, that such that it's an arbitrary distribution. And now I'll say you apply single qubit depolarizing channel on your state. So now mm. you sample a state, you want it to predict, you don't just want it to predict that state, but you, you, you want it to predict um, when you have some noise in it, what's the outcome. Uh, I think in that case, one might potentially also have these kind of um, low degree um, mm. approximation to hold. And I think in that case, it would be at least sort of technique technically probably also much closer to what they were they were okay. doing. Um, but in this case, um, the, the state is can actually be pure, but it's kind of like because of the randomness and the randomization of the initial state, it causes the collapse. Um, so I'm not sure. Maybe there are also some relation um, mm -hmm. of that effect that's being that could be that yeah. could be connected back. But yeah, I haven't haven't seen how how it's 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 uh, it's connected yet. So something so, something else that would be kind of you know I think an interesting question is you know let's assume that what you had is you had a um, arbitrary differential equation that you wanted to solve. Well, let's say a linear differential equation, and um, you are given access to the dynamics through a block encoding hmm. of it. I'm kind of curious, you know, what uh, to what extent the the types of results that have been you know developed so far, like your own, would be usable in order to be able to identify the differential equation that's being block encoded in the larger unitary. Because one of the problems with the block encoding is you often are going to need a uh, relatively high poly weight uh, term in order to be able to specify the particular block that you're interested in. So do you know of any way that you could get the, the, the notion of channel learning and, you know, and uh, block encodings to play nicely together? Mm, I see. So my intuition is usually when you get access to block encoding, it's a stronger form of access. So then you can kind of like, um, Access it more? Is that the right intuition that I should have? Well, I shouldn't think deeply about the block encoding part, but. Okay, because I mean, you could view it as an, or as an oracle, right? And every time that you're looking at your channel learning problem, you can view that as an oracle identification problem where you've got a oracle that ends up implementing a single invocation of your channel. Mm. And what you'd like to be able to do is you'd like to be able to come up with a model or a specification of what that oracle is. Mm -hmm. And the same thing ends up happening with, you know, something like a uh, block encoding of a differential equation where, you know, you've got an oracle that ends up describing the larger unitary and you'd like to be able to parameterize that by its action only on a sub block of the, of the Hilbert space that it acts on. And that, that behavior inside that sub block need not be unitary. And that's one of the key things in order to be able to implement a non, uh, you know, non-unitary dynamics like you would see in, say, you know, some dissipative differential equation. And so, you know, it would be really cool to be able to use these results to be able to say, hey, I don't have to just learn dynamics inside the quantum formalism. I could actually, um, you know, kind of uh, pack the quantum pack learnish, <laughs> uh, you know, arbitrary dynamical systems. But in order to be able to do that, you need to find a way to be able to get these ideas to play well with the block encoding. So that way you can fit those problems inside the quantum formalism easily. 
So I was just wondering if you thought about it, but you know, the answer is that might still be an open question to see how far we can push uh, these sorts of ideas in that in that direction. Right. So in, in those kind of settings, you're you're you have this differential equation that you try to learn. Is that is that what you're as an saying? example? Yeah, you could consider you know like some some differential equation that's be whose solution is being uh, block encoded by you know say a solution say the um uh, differential equation solver which uh that barry et al did ages ago which involves like a matrix inverse of the uh d uh of the differential operator that they're carrying out so the block uh the way it works is a, it, this is a unitary operation a sub block of that larger unitary operation is the solution to the differential equation in essence and what you'd like to be able to do is you'd like to be able to uh, build a model for the solution to the differential equation, given access to the larger unitary as your channel. I see, I see. But you don't care about the channel as a whole. You only end up caring about this one block of, uh, of the, the process matrix. I guess in that case, you probably wanted to consider, say, different input yeah. distribution because in order to access that specific block and so on. So mm -hmm. at least it, it feels like one, that's kind of one, what I was thinking too. Yeah. Yeah. I think one way to go forward is to first better understand sort of how well does these kind of channel learning um, results apply to different set of distributions. So currently we show that when distribution satisfy this constraint, then we can do this. But perhaps it holds for even more distribution, and then that might eventually give rise to what you were suggesting, perhaps. Um, but along similar lines, it's also interesting that almost all the work inside this space is really strongly wedded to a po to poly representations. Mm. So you know there there are some physically relevant settings, like for example, if you're dealing with a bosonic system where it's very difficult to be able to represent the natural operators as a polynomially sized uh, uh, linear combination of poly operators. Mm. So there may actually also be other, other examples of representations of channels that may still be efficient to learn, but might not be efficient inside the you know, framework of low intersection Hamiltonians and the like that have been studied so far. I see, I see. Yeah. So, um, well, re really impressive work, Robert. So, can I ask you a question? You know, just a clarifying way. So, you you did motivate all this in the in the beginning of your talk. You you know, sort of said in what what setting this might be useful. But that was, uh, you know, that was before we got to the the actual results and understood the setting. So, at least for me and maybe for others, it might be helpful if you were to. Now that we've seen all this, if you were to go back and say, you know, how do you think this would be useful, or you know, can you can you make up a setting where where this would this would actually be uh, you could see it being useful? Yeah, that's actually a um, a very nice question. I did I, indeed. I didn't didn't go back and talk about sort of implications. Um, it was part of it was discussed in the paper, but but it's nice that you brought it up. I should mm -hmm. sort of say a few words about what I think. Um, so for example, like in the first example that I said was say that you wanted to learn a model so that now given some specification for initial state, you can predict what would happen under some complex physical process and predict what would happen at the end. Um, so, so one specific example would be, I, I think I briefly mentioned it was like, you have some ground state or low energy thermal states of your of some generic Hamiltonian that's like local, ge generic local Hamiltonian. And that now you have this as initial state and you wanted to say, do a evolution under it. So maybe you change the Hamiltonian suddenly, you apply some magnetic field, you, you do some things with it. And now it will evolve and then generate some output state. And maybe you wanted to measure some kind of, uh, some like thermodynamic quantity of it. And I think that would potentially be an example that fits into it. The only problem is, do people really care about ground states of some generic local Hamiltonian? Maybe they only care about 
very specific translational invariant Hamiltonian and so on. So that part is still a little bit unclear, um, but at least this specific example that I said, it will work like all the theorem will go through and, and we can indeed make a good prediction of that. So that's the first example. The second example I talk about is in quantum machine learning. So you have a quantum neural network. And so for example, one, one thing that people do is they take a classical vector and they map it into what people call cubic rotation. So it's like you, the, 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 there's like undimensional vector. Now you map it into an n-qubit system where each qubit is just like rotating um, by an angle based on the real value of the system. And now you will try to train the parameterized quantum circuit, some deep one or shallow one, and then measure something at the end. And usually what people hope is that this class of function taking you, you from X into the output um, is going to be in general hard to, hard to simulate classically because it's a quantum circuit. Um, so hopefully it will have more expressive power than classical ML algorithm. One thing what this result says is suppose your input is just some say zero to two pi, and then it's like uniformly random in that space. And now you do qubit rotation to map it into say, just like, like say on this, on the slice of block sphere. Um, one can prove that no matter how deep your quantum neural network is, even if it's exponentially deep, that whole thing can be computed. Mm -hmm. That whole thing can be computed by some classical model that's only take quasi-polynomial time. So it means there's a collapse in it. So even if your quantum circuit is exponentially deep, it can be simulated by the quasi-polynomial thing. But it's not a usual form of simulation because given the circuit, you actually cannot write, like write down what that classical model is. Um, but what, it, what the result says is it's not more expressive. So if you have the, another class and you use this like you compare these two classes to learn some other function using quantum neural network will not be like and this particular form would not be more powerful so that would be one application in sort of a more negative light and then the third example that i talked about was like can you speed up complex quantum dynamics and i think this result says you can indeed do it um at least from exponential to quasi polynomial but it's not entirely clear if you just have a polynomial thing can you even compress it further. So that, 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 that still remains to be understood um, further. So. I think I finally got like a classical analog that I kind of understand. Yeah. Can I run it by you? Yeah, yeah so go ahead. I, was, I mean, I was a little sort of mystified by the fact that like, okay, there's literally any quantum channel at all in the middle. So I guess the way you sort of handle it is you, you know, do the transpose and stick it onto the observable. So now you're like, okay, well, now it's a little worrisome because I have literally any observable at all. Uh, and if you have literally any observable and you don't have much assumptions about your input distribution or state, this is going to be not so good. So it must be that like you have to um, kind of change your like figure of merit of like how well you're going to evaluate, like how well you did learning on this distribution or distribution on distributions. I guess you need a distribution on distributions to measure things. And I guess like still like it can't just be like, oh, like it can be any state or any distribution because that's a worst case thing. So it's kind of like you you have this assumption that like, well, if I if I draw from the distribution, I, I want like distributions on states where like first I draw from the state and then I don't mind if you like stick extra noise on top of that state. Like that's still the distribution. And then I'm going to average over this. So Maybe the, the right classical analog is like, okay, you can have any, um, you're trying to so, learn like- that averaging is only done outside, right? Like you're comparing different circuit and then you need to make good prediction for- all, all the circuits been pushed into the observable though. So like there's no circuit anymore. You're just, uh, you're getting a randomly chosen distribution and you have to learn on average over the choice of this randomly chosen distribution or state, right? And like it's always like a totally there, there's, there's a the there's a single distribution over quantum state, um, and you have to learn well under that distribution, right? So, uh, yeah, that's like right. Say random product state, so but like the fact that it's like locally flat is kind of similar to saying like you take this distribution over states, and you have to not mind if like you 
take those states, but then like put some additional like noise on them in a certain sense. So, I would, so one way I think about it is like, fun. so you take arbitrary distribution of states mm -hmm. and now you create a new distribution, which mm -hmm. the new distribution is generally as follows. You first sample from that distribution row yep. and now you apply say a uh, depth one random circuit. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And like, you have a very tough task because you're learning like literally a completely arbitrary observable. Yes. Um, yeah, so I think maybe the right like, classical and like thing that like it was, feels like a satisfying classical analog to me is like okay you're learning a completely arbitrary function on the boolean cube into i don't know if it's bounded or not but anyway a completely maybe uh, it should be bounded it should be bounded it should okay be bounded. bounded um and then you're going to be kind of getting like a randomly chosen distribution to learn about and i was like oh this is very bad because like you have a randomly chosen point distribution but not really like like you said like you first somebody randomly choose the point distribution but then that distribution is like further noised and so like i think like what you not really of... like you just apply another circuit so if you right. so classical I... analog you apply a classical boolean circuit then that's still a point distribution it's not yeah so i think like the right model is maybe like you take the distribution and you make a new distribution where like you star out or question mark out or erase like a random subset of the bits. And then you measure how well you're doing with respect to this kind of like uniform on a subcube. It's like a mixture of uniform on subcubes kind of distributions. Mm -hmm. um, and this is kind of good because like, if you're like, oh, if the distribution, if the thing I'm trying to learn is parity, like how can I possibly learn it? Like for every different point distribution, like I have a different parity plus or minus one, never gonna learn it. But like the lucky thing is like once you take your even your point distribution and you put this extra, basically you pass it through an erasure channel. Mm -hmm. Like once you pass this point distribution through an erasure channel, parity basically becomes the zero function. So um, you have a hope to learn it. Right. Right. So in some sense, like this extra maybe erasure channel is like, okay, I, I think I get it now. Yeah, I think the erasure <laughs> channel, wow, well, it's like mixed channel, but in the quantum case, you can make it pure, but something like that yes yeah and like like pure it, channel it, pure random circuit is kind of like erasure channel I think yeah this is like kind of like maybe what like nathan was saying like every analogy is like a little bit imperfect but like right, right, right. you break something I, yeah. I feel i now feel like satisfied with this analogy where like the story is you're learning kind of under a worst case distribution but like your friend helps you out a little bit by saying like well actually i'm gonna take the worst case distribution and like pass it through erasure channel and now you're like, oh, thank God. Like now, uh, like the high frequencies are not going to bother me anymore. And so now it's much more like I'm like a low degree, mm -hmm. like every observable is like a low degree observable. Okay, cool. I, I, this <laughs> I'm glad I, I'm, I got on the right track. Thank you. Great. Uh, well, um, unless there's, there's some, something else, uh, uh, another comment, I think. Well, uh, one, yeah, right, one Nathan. One thing actually I'd like to to get out of you, uh, Robert, is I'm kind of curious. What do you think are the 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 next frontiers in this space? Because after all, you know the uh, the the frontier around Hamiltonian learning, as well as you know this uh, uh, well your your new channel learning result has been really rapidly expanding. So you know if you were to kind of make a call to arms for people to think about some problems uh, in this space, what what would you recommend people start thinking about? Yeah, that's also a great question. Um, let me think a little bit. So personally, I am interested in the following question, which I think might be too ambitious because there is no <laughs> classical analog of it. But not, not 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 like I mean, the classical analog of it hasn't been developed yet. But I was wondering, like, what kind of quantum algorithm can we actually learn? Like if you're just given some examples and now we're being asked to, to, to design a quantum algorithm for solving those examples and it has to generalize to bigger system size and so on. Is there even hope that we can say something um, um, about the ability to learn quantum algorithm and, and so on? I think that's a challenging question and I don't really know how to really ad address that question. So I would say that that would be something like classically, you can also say, ask the same thing. How do you design classical <laughs> algorithm? I don't think there's like, like Ryan said, everything is not yeah. learnable. It's just <laughs> not efficient. And I don't know how one could do it, but it seems like even 
um, like empirically, people have been doing a lot of interesting things that are approaching that point. I mean, they're not really designing super good algorithm. I mean, there's this. Metric. The swap test algorithm was pretty interesting. Oh, that's true. That's true. You mean the quantum, the variational one where they yeah. find the belt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's indeed true. Yeah, like, but that's more like heuristic. Like, if you just try, and then they they saw that it seems to be able to find something good. Exactly. At a point. It's very that's different true. than re being able to rigorously approve something like you can in pack context. Yeah. So that would be one thing that I'm personally very interested in. Another thing that was actually being often asked by by physicists is they 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 tell me that. Oh, I what I really want the machine learning algorithm to do is not just to like do some benchmarking and pre predict some property, but I wanted to learn new physics. And I was like, I have no idea how one could do that. Um, so like, is it possible to have algorithm that can actually learn kind of new things in quantum systems? And what does it mean to be new? I don't know. Like it, it, <laughs> that would be very, the people are trying in a more empirical way. Um, and I think it would be interesting if there are some rigorous ground that we can make. Of course, that would be hard. I feel like that's still, that, that's very challenging, but I, I would really hope that if like learning theory can develop to a point that we can say something interesting about these kind of very more high level questions. And, and on a more technical note, I think, and Ryan should also comment on it. I think even just the original shadow tomography, there is still this big open question, which I don't know the answer to, which is, so, so in, in the original shadow tomography, the task is you have a quantum state role, and now you can have multiple copy of the state, and now you want it to be able to estimate a large number of property. Um, and, and Scott Aronson has some results saying that if you wanted to do it in the following way, that is you have all these copies, you wanted to have a quantum circuit that turn it into some small, classical description, like polynomial size classical description, such that by using that classical description, you can predict a large number of property, um, you will collapse certain things. Basically, quant advice would be equal to classical advice, so it's not likely that it's true. But I think the following more simpler setting might still be true, which is suppose you have these multiple copies of your state that you can store in your quantum memory. You never turn it into a classical description, but you just store it. And now you can, every time every time people, someone would come by and say, hey, I'm, I care about this observable. It's it's easy to write down. This here is the circuit. Um, and you can perform some quantum computation on top of it. Um, can you actually do it computationally efficiently while only using like poly log M amount of copies of the state? And I think that's not clear. Uh, like, I, I, at least I don't know if there's a, there's a, there's a computation hardness for it or whether we can actually create a computationally efficient algorithm for it. Ryan, have you thought about this? No, I didn't quite miss the setup. Is it not, it's not just adaptive uh, shadow tomography, is it? Is that what you mean or no? I think it's just, yeah, it's just adaptive. Like you can keep a quantum memory. So you never really turn it into just classical description that like you just hmm. it. And now people come, you do some measurements. Um, I think it's kind of almost there, right? Like I think your Actually, protocol for, Threshold so I think, search is good, right? But the yeah, I think even like one of the earlier papers by Aronson achieves adaptive version, doesn't it? I don't think so. The online learning of quantum state is bad. Uh, that is computationally very hard. Oh, you're interested with the computational efficiency. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, no, I no. don't know. I have to think about that. Yeah, I don't know. So at least I I feel like like having that would be very useful because then mm -hmm. in the future you can just store some number of quantum data and now whatever things come, you can predict. Kind of similar to this case. For example, if this works, then you can bootstrap what I just talked about for channel learning to predicting more observable. Like here we focus on observables that are essentially just like local observables. But now if what I, what we just talked about here, uh, like what I just said works, then you can just boost it into like predicting any observable, um, like any efficiently measurable observable. Um, if, if I think they have these same, like same dilemmas though, even in the classical adaptive data analysis case though, where like they have like much worse guarantees if you have to be computationally efficient. Ah, uh, but it's still efficient. Oh. Um, no, but, but I think you can like tolerate like, no, you can't tolerate like poly log M in that case. This is like, you can only get like square root M or whatever, if I'm not Wait, mistaken, really? which I might be mistaken, but uh we should check into like whether you can even like anybody's managed to do it even in the classical case i would the I would classical say. case shout out to margraphy what i just said you can do it right um like suppose this density metrics row is diagonal then then this can be done efficiently uh, 
adaptively. I'll, I'll check my, maybe I don't, okay. I'll catch up with you later because maybe I don't either exactly remember my sources or we're maybe talking about slightly different problems. Sounds good. Yeah, but yeah, that's another from a more technical side. I think that's at least to me, it's big open question. I thought about it quite for 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 a very long time, but I still don't know um, how to solve it. Okay, great. Uh, well, you know, this was really a fantastic talk and great discussion afterwards. Um, so thanks, Robert, and thanks, uh, thanks Nathan and, uh, and uh, Tom and. Uh, and Brian, um, thanks so much, Robert. Thank yeah, Brian. thank you so much. Yeah, it's like great talk. It was very fun. Thank you. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye bye.